cometh upon me daily the care of all the churches. You may just permit me, if you don't mind, just a minute to add the last character of Luke 8, because I don't think we can walk away from the good seed, for the seed falling upon good ground. Uh, the good ground is the fertile soil, soil that is uh, ready, receptive, it has potential, there is material there for the roots to take, uh, uh, the seed to take root and result in what? Fruit. Uh, it says, that which, that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart. We've been talking about the heart as the basis for the receptivity of the word of God and the production of some result. So it's the good heart. Having heard the word of God, what happens is they keep it. It's treasured. It becomes a valuable uh, thing in their, in their lives. It becomes reality. They keep it. And then it says, bring forth fruit with patience. Now this particular setting is genuine, true believers. That's who we are. And the result of the word of God upon us is that the heart is affected, we treasure it, we keep it, and we bring forth fruit. Now, how do we bring forth fruit? It is in patience. If you notice that the, the uh, man who is the farmer, he does not expect that fruit is going to be yielded as soon as he puts the seed in the ground. He recognizes that there is going to be a timeline, a process that takes place. The seed dies, produces fruit, a uh, 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 root, and then it springs up, and then ultimately it produces fruit. So it's a process. So it's a matter of patience that brings ultimately the hundredfold. And so that's the kind of response, I think, that should be with us now, hundredfold in terms of what is for God. Now remember that it is God's interest that there should be fruit in us. This leads us into our current passage in Luke 10, where we deal with Mary and Martha, who are two believers. So they have uh, had hearts that have been plowed and have received the word, and they love the Lord Jesus. Uh, but there's a difference uh, between them. And that difference, really, we can, uh, <clears throat> we can connect it with the, 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 the fruit in terms of uh, how much fruit it bears. In Luke, we see in, in verse 9, uh, chapter 8, verse, verse 8, that they bear fruit a hundredfold. But in the two other mentioning, mention of the, uh, the parable of the sower, we see a little bit more detail. In Matthew, a hundredfold, sixty, and thirty. And also in Mark, it says thirty, sixty, and a hundred. So this tells us, really, there's a distinction even among believers of how much fruit one bears. And so now going to Mary and Martha, we see that Mary obviously was doing the right thing, but Martha was missing something. And that, that which was missing is really tied to our subject at hand. The Lord Jesus says, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. In other words, she has an anxious heart. She is of an anxious uh, mindset. And that is what would deprive her of bearing the fruit which is the full fold of the hundred. And so this is the thought as to the distinction between the, the different believers in terms of how much fruit is there may be things that would hinder them from bearing the full load, if you will. And in this case, it's the anxious mindset of Mark. A question. Can service be a distraction? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Can help us along there. Said. <laughs> like your response. <laughs> I would uh, suggest from the passage that we read that it's, uh, it's obvious that service in itself is not fruitfulness. But service can be part of fruitfulness. But uh, we see with Martha, a service that seems to be more filled with anxiety and filled with performance rather than the mode of the heart. And I think the heart is what we were connecting with before. And Martha, I believe, is a woman. She's a woman of faith. She believes, but she needs adjustment. And a lot of us need adjustment, don't we? And I think this is something we see it, we see taking place here. And we see her adjusted in John 12. We see her beautifully. And she's serving there, too. But I think she's serving with a different object, with a different motive. She's serving because she loves the Lord. And she's serving the Lord and His people. But here she's serving because she has to serve. <laughs> and she's so occupied with service that she, she's angry that Mary is not helping her to do it. And so it's really a <coughs> problem when we think that our service is more important than the Lord. And that's what I believe she's done. She's put her service above the Lord here. Service also can have the element of self, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. So service is a part of fruitfulness. It is a part of fruitfulness. But service in and of itself can and will be a distraction. There is a distinction that must be made here between Mary and Martha. And that distinction is between service of Christ and service for Christ. Service of Christ and service for Christ. Very often, most of us are involved in service for. And we use that as the indicator as to how well we are doing spiritually. Because I'm serving. Look at what I'm doing. I'm preaching the gospel. I'm ministering the word. I'm going here. I'm going there. It has to be that, that uh, something is going well with me for God. But it could be, as Brother Saeed is saying, it could be something in the energy of self. And self, anything that is self-propelled and self-motivated isn't going to yield very much at the judgment seat, is it? Even though in your eyes, all that I have done looks very appealing. And that's service for. But service of Christ takes on, I think, a completely different perspective. The heart is occupied with the person, not the service. The heart is occupied with the person, with Christ. And if I'm occupied with Christ, then what I do will be indicative of the fact that my heart is in its right place. I will not just be doing things. I will be uh, a pleasure to the one who has called me. So that, I believe, is the distinction. You have Martha serving. She's actively doing that. And she's so bothered by it that she says to the Lord, aren't you looking around and noticing that, that uh, Mary is just sitting by, doing nothing, but here I am, completely occupied. She's attempting to challenge the Lord to change the picture. And what does he do? Does he turn around and change the picture? He certainly doesn't. He says, Mary has taken the good part. And he's not going to rob her of that. So it's a real distinction between the, the, the exercises that both Martha and Mary carry on. There's a, in, in line with that thought, you know, there, there's a, an intro here that we see. He says, uh, Martha, Martha, uh, the, uh, God uh, Almighty uh, and the mountain says, Moses, Moses, because there's a, there's a centralization, there's a, a focus that he wants Moses to have. On him, nothing else. You know, he sees a bush. He sees a bush, but then it's Moses. Look, look at look at me. Paul is met on the way, and the Lord Jesus says, "Paul, you know, Paul, why does thou curse you?" There's a focus that the Lord brings Paul into, and I think here we see him saying, "Martha, Martha, it's me. You're worried about a lot of things. 
But when the Lord calls her twice, it's a focus. It's look, look at me. Focus on me. And I, and I think we see that in Scripture with the, the, the name repeated in those instances where we see names repeated in the calling. Look on me. Focus on me. You're not focused on me. When you don't focus on me, you've got so many cares. And isn't that what happens? We don't focus on the Lord Jesus, and then suddenly we have so many cares. The person who gets choked, it says they go away. So to me, they turn, right? To go away means you turn your back and you look the other way. And the Lord Jesus says, and you go away. That means you turn your back on what you've heard, and now you occupy yourself with the things that are opposite me, and these things choke you. Their cares, their riches, they're these things. Focus on me, and these things will not trouble you. There's a thought here. In verse 38, we see Martha is the one that received the Lord Jesus Christ into her house. It is a good thing, an open heart, uh, that takes in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, that we too, in like manner, should be in this sense, not cumbered about many things, but ready to take the Lord Jesus in. We can do that. It may be a brother on a journey and desire a place for us, a place for himself. And here is a sister or a brother open their house. Here, he re here she receives him. And this is one of the good things. While in the, as we go down the line, we see where martyr is cumbered. She had many anxious thoughts we would say. I think it's important to highlight that because there is a side that is commendable mm -hmm. of Martha. And I think that that's the point that Brother Thompson is bringing out. There is a commendable side. That is, she's hospitable. She knows the gift of hospitality and she is exercising it. But at the same time, what is commendable can very well become a distraction if we're not careful. And that's the point, I think, that is being emphasized here. I think in 41 he says, thou art careful, so he recommends her first. But then he says, you are troubled, which is uh, uh, the opposite, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. What, what uh, Martha was doing was not wrong in itself, mm -hmm. and it was not forbidden. Mm -hmm. But allowing him to take the first place and uh, this weight uh, on her spirit, you know, weight on her spirit down. And that's what is wrong. We have to realize that services end on earth. Communion with the Lord continues far beyond time mm -hmm. and all eternity. And that's the communion that comes in the type in Mary now that sat at his feet. That is where the service of Christ comes in, because that's her occupation. What if we don't have something about the difference of uh, personalities here? That we see Martha is the one that seems from the scriptures we have presented as a more, she has a more administrative way about her. She has a way of organizing, and like you talked about hospitality. She's the one that could put this together, as it were. Well, Mary may not have had that ability to do that, but Mary had a heart. Mary had a heart for the Lord. We see that as tears of her heart come out later. Mary's the one at the tomb. Mary wept while well, Martha needed an answer. Martha needed some facts. Mary just needed a tear. Jesus wept. And then we see in John 12 that Mary is at his feet with the ointment. Martha's <coughs> serving there, but I think her heart's been adjusted correctly. And so she can serve out of, of a pureness of heart. I, I was just thinking of uh, Colossians 3 where it speaks even of servants. And it says, servants obey in all things your masters. So they were in a situation that could produce a lot of anxiety. And yet it says here, uh, obey in all things your masters according to flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. For whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, 
knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. So service, if it's put in the right place, done heartily as unto the Lord, is something for the glory of God, even in a very limited circumstances. But I believe that, like you're saying, well, Mary's heart is in the right place here in Luke 10. There should be a balance, though, Brother John, wouldn't you think, uh, that it's not so much that uh, Mary should not be in the capacity of service uh, or that Martha should not be in the capacity of being at the feet of the Lord. Both should be, right? But we need to understand the place and that where that is carried out. Martha missed it completely and felt that more of serving at the moment was more important than spending the time at the feet of the Lord Jesus. Mary, on the other hand, knew when to serve, where to serve. She knew when to be at the feet of the Lord Jesus and not occupied with service. So there must be a, a, a balance in regard to those things. Well, we break, if we break down her response, we see a little bit of selfish, the space of selfishness. I'm doing, right away, let's face it, we always say, she starts off saying, well, I'm doing this and she's doing, well, instantly there's a comparison, isn't there? There's an elevation, there's a level, wait, 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 wait. What I'm doing, what she's doing, wait, what I'm doing is good. Why, why are you looking at her as if she's made out of gold? What about me? You see? Mm -hmm. See, this is, this is, this is where it gets to the level, is again, the focus. If she does her service with Christ in mind, she never thinks about herself. But when she does her service and compares herself to others, mm -hmm. then she's lost focus. And so, and so it's so, and this is uh, what brought the exercise to our hearts, I think, to Elias, is that difference is so subtle that it happens a little bit and a little bit and more and more and suddenly you rationalize or justify things. And that's what should happen. We talk about the heart being ready. Plow, the field is plowed and the soil is... Well, obviously, there was a little resentment maybe in one way or another, right? Something that... And so she was comparing. When she had the Lord of glory in front of her, why are you comparing? Why, why do you even try? Why don't you put yourself relative to him in your own place, and then you won't be looking at your brother or sister in a certain way. There, there's not that comparison. You focus on Christ and not on... And, and again, that's how we get in trouble. And so it's very subtle, but it, it's there. And then those kind of things build. Lord, judge here, Martha, that thou art careful and troubled. I want to link this back to the parable of the sower and mention, of course, the cares, the, uh, the, the pleasures, riches. the riches, and then the pleasures. This does not deal with the pleasures nor the riches. This is with the first one, the cares of this life. And that's what he's judging Martha to be uh, missing the mark on. And remember the meaning of the cares is that one is occupied with something by distraction, via distraction. And that's what we've been hinting at here, is instead of being like Mary, who sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word, she was focused on something else, which in itself may be a good thing, serving the Lord himself. But it was distracting, and it was a preoccupation really with the wrong thing, as the Lord discerns here. And the application to us is sometimes we are like Martha in heart. We can sometimes get distracted with attending meeting, doing the right things externally, superficially, serving in some capacity, but really we're doing it just to, uh, as, a, as a justification, really. To say that we're in a good state of heart, where really we're not taking the time to sit at his feet and hear his word. And so we try to cover it up with the Martha feature in service. 
Now it's possible if we might connect with 1 Corinthians 12 that in Martha's eyes uh, Mary might have been an uncommonly part in her eyes. Uh, she is minimizing Mary. Now, Lord, don't you don't you care that she's uh, that what she's doing is 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 really not important as far as I'm concerned. Uh, she's really not engaged in something that is of notoriety, as I am. I'm serving. I'm getting the meal on the table and so on and so forth. But he comes back and says that he attaches importance to those parts that don't appear to be comely. In your eyes, they're just as important to me. And the service that Mary is carrying on is a service that, not, that will not be taken from her. She has uh, uh, taken the good part. Well, we, we judge, don't we, a lot. Mm -hmm. We don't leave the judgment of things to the Lord, and we, we judge. And she judged her. And that wasn't her, her place to do that, to judge. Um, what is our, what uh, Elias is, was, is alluding to is we need to judge our actions. We need to uh, 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 put ourselves before the Lord. The, the cure for care is prayer. And, uh, and so we need to put ourselves before the Lord and exercise ourselves with respect to those things that that we have and then leave them because no, notice Mary's at the feet she's left in other words, she's taken that posture she's she's at the feet of Jesus and she's left those things Martha's standing and walking around and saying oh oh this oh that no 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 she hasn't taken in her heart that position yet the Lord Jesus said to uh Pharisees in Luke 7, or Mark 7, sorry, when they brought an issue before him concerning the washing of hands, a great concern about doing what was right in their own eyes. And the Lord said, uh, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. I think we have to be careful. This is a, that's verse 6 of chapter 7 of Mark. We have to be careful of that. Uh, having the right externals, the right lip service, as it were, but the heart of being far from the Lord. If that's something we can't look around the room and say, I wonder if his heart's far from the Lord. No, we have to look right here. <laughs> we have to Lord, ask the Lord, show me, Lord, what's in my heart. You know, in Psalms 39, it says, Surely every man walketh in a vain show. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches and knoweth not who shall gather them. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in Thee. When we think of Mary, when Lazarus had died, Martha went to meet the Lord, but Mary sat still and waited for Him to come because she, having been at His feet before, how much she had learned untold riches that He had imparted to her. And she had an insight far deeper than what Martha had. Mary always appears to have a settled sense of what's important. She always did. Here is an evidence of it. Uh, another evidence of it is uh, in John 12 when they made him a supper, which is a slightly different setting. But then also when it came to the burial of the Lord, uh, Mary is not there at the cemetery. And there's a reason why. There are other women there, but Mary was not there. Now you would think that she should have been there, wouldn't you? If she loves him that much. But you see, she had risen to the true character of the death of the Lord Jesus. She had already anointed him. So there was no need for her to be at the cemetery. So she had advanced in her thoughts in relation to him. So Mary is always an excellent character. Now, I think we need to notice that there are contrasts that are being made here. In the book of Luke, you find that the Lord is always wanting to move us from one state to another. In the previous chapter is the chapter where you had the lawyer uh, wanting to find out about you know, how you in, uh, inherit eternal life. And he gets the parable of the man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And then when he's finished getting the parable and he's asked the question, he's asking the question, who is my neighbor? 
And that's why the Lord brought the parable in when he brought out the expressions of the law. He says, who is my neighbor? So what is happening is that the Lord desires to move us from being lawyers to neighbors. He also wants to move us from being Marthas to Marys. And that's why in chapter 11, we have prayer being introduced that the disciples are stirred up to, uh, to ask the Lord, teach, teach us, us to, to pray. pray. And so, as was mentioned before in Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing but pray. And we just heard it again. This is the answer. We're going to cover that in the third reading in more detail. But I'd like to soak a little bit more in verse 40 about Martha. So we understand a little bit more the problem and, and what, what, what it really leads to. Uh, as we look here, when she's cumbered about, and we've touched on it before, there's just one other point I want to bring out. She said, Lord, <coughs> dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. Now, someone brought out that she's really accusing her sister or judging her sister. But there's another accusation that she's made. Duh, duh, not th dost, thou dost thou not care? Not care? Yes. The Lord. She's accusing the Lord of not caring for her and, and for the things around her. Mm -hmm. And so that's the problem that one gets into. Not only judging and accusing your brothers of not performing, doing what they should be doing, but there's also the, the problem that one can get into of accusing the Lord. How can you allow this? Mm -hmm. How come I'm doing this and my brothers aren't doing this? And, and so there's that accusation, and we know that the accuser, where do those thoughts come from? The accuser of the brethren, the devil. So that's the problem with the mindset. It's not just a thought here, an anxious thought, a, a care for this. No, it's a mindset that's being addressed here by the Lord when he says, Thou art careful and troubled about not just this one thing here, but many things. It's a mindset of Martha. And it's the mindset that we're tr we want to address today of being anxious and careful about too many things. So even the prophet of God would say, there's no one else who, who serves, you know, and the Lord had to open his eyes for him to see. Yes, I have, a I have those who serve me. And so that... That perspective of I'm, oh me, I'm, I'm a wiggly worm, I'm by myself, there's no one else, there's no one else, I'm the only one who really does what you want, you know, as a perspective. But like you said, then to say, don't you care about me? You know, what, what about me? And again, this, the issue still is a, is a basic issue of where we see ourselves in relationship <coughs> to others and then where we see ourselves with respect to God. And we bring ourselves to a level of saying, you, you've got to give me my due. Wait, wait, we, we're, we're created. We're creatures. What, what, what place do we have? And yet, here she is, saying that to the Lord. How is this problem adjusted in her life? Because we, you know, we might, in our hearts, be sitting here thinking, well, I tend to have that problem. I tend to think that way at times. And how, is, how does the Lord adjust this that we might be fruitful, as we talked about before? I'm just wondering, in, in her life, we have first the Lord's word here, the Lord's rebuke. Is that, That's one element of the adjustment. But I believe in John 11, I think we get another aspect of how the Lord works to change our hearts. And that's another aspect of discipline. And we have the death of the brother. And the Lord... I believe the Lord used that in her life. Because remember, it was just said, Lord, do you not care? And then in chapter 11 of John, it says in verse 3, Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he, he whom thou lovest is sick. And I take that to me. I believe Martha sent that message. And what she's saying is, Lord, don't you care? Our, my, the one that you love is sick. And the Lord waits. The Lord doesn't go and heal him of his sickness. He could have done that. He was so pleased. But the Lord waits. Because the Lord had bigger things to teach them. Not only about the fact that he's a resurrection of the life, but Martha's heart needed changing. 
She had to learn that, yes, he cares, but his purposes and design are higher than ours. And so I think through this, we see Martha really changed so that she, in chapter 12, is a changed woman. She heard his word, and she experienced the discipline, and she has a different way of approaching service altogether so that she can serve with joy and serve the Lord in her heart. Now, I was thinking that it's not only the idea of comparing ourselves with our brethren or with one another, which is dangerous as we're seeing here. But sometimes we could bring the Lord into question in our own circumstances that we are experiencing in our personal lives by saying, Lord, why have you allowed this to happen to me? Why me? In a sense, you're almost asking him, why not you? Why not the other person? Uh, but so we need to be mindful of that, that even in our own personal circumstances, we can have a tendency of bringing his actions into question. Now, if we go back to the prophet uh, Nelson is referring to, Elijah, I think in reference to your question, Brother John, how do we get adjusted? How did Elijah get adjusted? Well, Elijah was removed from the sphere of service, and Elisha was put in his place. After the Lord told him, uh, there are 7,000 prophets that have not bowed the knee to Baal. Do you realize that? You're thinking you were the only one. But let me tell you, I've got 7,000 reserved. So sometimes what he has to do is remove us from that sphere so that we might understand that if I thought he needed me and that I was so indispensable, he will remind me how I am not indispensable because there are many others. So that's one way of adjusting. I think also when you come to Mary and Martha, the adjustment takes place prior to John 12. It doesn't specify where it takes place, but we are assured that it took place prior to John 12. Because what you get in John 12 is, there they made him a supper. It shows that there is cohesiveness, a oneness, Oneness in purpose and objective. They made him a supper. Martha is not now complaining about this, that, and the other. Lazarus is not now talking about how sick he is. Nothing of that nature. Rather, there is every indication of, a, of hearts that are in harmony, one with another, with the objective of making him a supper. There is what we think we could say a life learning and processing here in this scene to make us more fit and more at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that in what he said to Martha. Martha said thus thou not care Yes, the Lord Jesus is care, and he had great concern for every one of us. But he had a place uh, that each of us must fit in. And so, as we see here, Martha is now being put in her place. But what the lesson there for us, that each and every one have that desire, though Martha's desire and care was anxious cares about serving. Mary, on the other hand, has a part of listening to the Lord Jesus Christ, taking the word of God and making it her own. And so we need to take the word of God and make it our own. Learn and live by that which the Spirit of God would daily teaches us as we go along. And that's the, for the first two readings, I think that's the key uh, that we see here is in answer to the question, how do you fix this problem of anxiety? It has to be through the Word of God. The sower sows the seed. And if we go with what a brother said, the sower being the Holy Spirit, sowing the seed, which is the Word of God, 
the, it, the, the, it's like a pl the Holy Spirit would be like a plowshare. He has to he has to plow the land before the seed is inserted. So the heart has to be uh, be be prepared, and then for the for the seed to come in, so that it can grow and mature. And so that's what we have in in the the parable of the sower being the agent by which growth and maturity come. And also here we can learn from Mary, who was sitting, giving time. And, and truly uh, hearing his word. And that's what would give us a different, that would, that's what would produce a different mindset so that we would not be anxious, but be of a different mindset altogether, which we'll talk about later. Could we say something about this matter of the good part? Now, I was always taught in English that when you do a comparison, it's either uh, bet, in this case, it should be better part, if you look at the English language. Uh, good, better, best. How come it is that the Lord says to her, uh, to Martha, that she's taken the good part? Why isn't it not the better part? Is it because it's not a, a comparison? It is good and bad? It's just the two. <laughs> the good part is Christ. Whether it's in service, whatever it is, the good part is Christ Himself. That's just a suggestion. <laughs> so this is not the idea of comparative, you're saying, and superlative. It is the idea that this is it. There is one standard. The good part is Christ. There is nothing better. It's the good part. And Mary recognizes that and she moves in that direction, takes that part, and she's to be commended for it. I just want a uh, proportion of Colossians 1.18, which says that in all things he might have the preeminence, being Christ. So preeminence is not prominence where there's a competition. Yes. But he is everything, and there's no second or third. And that's the thought here. Yes. And that's when we have him before us, then there, there, it will stifle out the competition of the things that would occupy our minds and distract us from him. Amen. And, and for Martha, she may not, she, well, she doesn't see maybe the sacrifice that Mary makes because she's still got a, she's got that foot in the service, in the, in the cares. And, and I say this in relationship with regards to, we, we make, we make sacrifices in focusing on Christ that, that we don't get to do some of the, we don't do some of the things that some might feel to be important or better, you know, that, that whole, and, and, some, and so uh, with the relationship of the world, right, because the cares of the world and the things, the cares of the world, the world says these things are important, these, these should be doing these types of things, you should be into this type of thing, but we forsake those things. So Martha, uh, Mary seems to be to Martha lazy. You get that tone. I'm serving, I'm doing something, she's doing nothing. Because she says, I'm doing this alone. You don't care. And I'm doing this alone. Well, you know, the world puts pressure, the cares of the thing. You know, you have to you know, do certain things and be certain places. And, you know, and, and these, there, there's pressure there. And here we have Martha, her sister, putting pressure on Mary. I mean, you, you have to also remember this circumstance. She doesn't pull the Lord Jesus aside in the secret place and say, she, she basically comes to the Lord and, and her sister's right there. And she says it in front of her sister. And she says, she does it purposely. She wants her sister to hear this. She wants the Lord to hear this, her complaint. And, and, and the world is, you know, it's so enticing. You know, there's so many things we can do, occupy. Patient wife, and so many, so many things that again in this in this realm here we see it subtle because it's a service that might seem to be a good thing, and then, but 
There's so many things that we say we need to do. We have to do. I've got to do it. Occupation, right? And then it becomes a care. Oh, I need to do it next. Oh, I, now this drags me into another realm of something else. No, no. What we need is Christ, right? That's what we just, what Elias said. What we need is Christ. What needs to be pre preeminent in our, our lives is Christ. Everything else will have its place. But Christ is first. And, and that's where the focus gets lost. Can we move to Philippians 2? Yeah. And uh, I just want to, if we go to Philippians 2, verse 20, I just want to point to this one word of being like-minded. We're talking about the mindset of being anxious or careful for the things of this life. And here Paul brings out in verse 20 of chapter 2, For I have no man like-minded. Which mind is this that he's talking? What kind of mindset? Well, we have to go back to verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What makes us be of like mind? Having different ages, different cultures, different backgrounds and teachings. What can make us all conform to a same mindset. It has to be that Word of God sown in the heart and the, the Holy Spirit indwelling us operating on the Word of God, changing us, conforming us into the image of, of His Son, which is our focus, the preeminence, who, who gets the preeminence. So here we have this like-mindedness between uh, Paul and Timothy, or the mind of Christ, who will naturally care for your state. This like-mindedness produces a care for the Philippians. And uh, as, as, as he would, and, and, and confidence by Paul in Timothy that he will care for you. Is it, is it brother, in light of what you're saying, is it because uh, the work in Paul's heart and the work in Timothy's heart was such that they had been set free from self. Mm. And that is our whole, that's our main problem. <laughs> Sin is really connected with self. And I believe the word in English, at least, is very convenient. The word sin has I in the middle. <laughs> so I is at the center of sin. And so it's interesting, these two seem to be moving in selfless, a selfless path so they could be vessels that easily could be used of the Lord to minister to others. But Timothy's heart was of such that Paul is making in a sense a comparison because he says, I have no man that's like-minded. The care of Paul and the care of the saints at Philippi, no one had such a keen sense of interest as did Timothy. He's basically saying all have gone off into their different courses. When you come to the book of Timothy and Paul begins to talk about the fact that he had been himself, his ministry had been forsaken, who do you find with Paul? Really, the Timothy, you find a Luke. There are just a few, a handful. But here he's saying, I could find no man who I could say is like-minded in terms of the deep commitment and interest of the Philippian saints. And, and the challenge again to us is what God wants to make us. We said earlier, he wants to move us from being Martha's to Mary, to Mary's. He want to move us now to being Timothy's, those who are like-minded with the Apostle Paul in, in his interest. Just one last thought on Martha and Mary, if you permit. I was thinking that when it comes to the matter of John 12, you will discover that there also Martha learned a very, very important lesson. She understood that Mary was at the feet of the Lord Jesus, while she wanted to serve. 
and she was very concerned and upset about it. But when you come to chapter 12, we said that everything is in harmony, everyone is in accord. And I'm pretty sure that at that moment, Martha learned that, you know what Mary was doing at the feet of Jesus? When she sat and heard his words, she was at the same time gathering the alabaster box of ointment to pour it out on him. So the proof was there. Here it is, Martha, the alabaster box of ointment is a labor that had gone on in the heart of Mary because it took energy to muster up all that was necessary to purchase that alabaster box of ointment. So Martha was able to recognize in John 12 that in truth and in fact, Mary wasn't lazy. She was putting together everything was, which was a suitable response to the one whom she loved. So in, in, Philipp in Philippians, Paul is, is desiring a like-mindedness uh, or bringing out the fact that there is a like-mindedness in Timothy. And as you pointed out, Brother Elias, that uh, the like-mindedness is the mind of Christ. And that's what is necessary for us to have the mind of Christ. this chapter, we see here Paul, between verse 5 and, and, and uh, that like mind, he says, here, here we have a, a little glimpse at Martha and Mary, do all things, in verse 14, without murmuring and, re and reasoning, that ye may be harmless and simple, irreproachable children of God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom ye appear as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. Holding forth the word of God, that 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 that's that standard, you know, that, that which they believe they hold held on to, and I love the the the, uh, the comparison uh, uh, here, harmless, harmless and and simple. There's not you you, you 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 have Christ and the Word of God, and your focus is on Him. You're not going to disrupt. You won't tear down. You won't cause problems. You won't be a Martha in in that. Way right, murmuring and reasoning, murmuring and complaining, but you'll be harmless and simple. But you'll be serviceable for God. In one instance, I think it is the Apostle Paul said, We have the mind of Christ, and here it is mentioned, No man like-minded. Here it is the concern for the Lord's things, the Lord's people, is that we who come to know him and are going in the word of God, filled by the knowledge of the Holy Spirit, are being taught daily, not so much to this world to be conformed to it, but to be in the renewing of our minds, occupied with Christ, which is the better things or the good path that shall never be taken away. So Paul was in prison when he wrote Philipp Philippians. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. his you would wonder what, you know, if from a natural mind, you would say, why, why is he concerned for others? I'm, I'm in dire straits. But he's sending Timothy in verse 19 that he may know their state. He's concerned about them. And he trusts that Timothy, because of like-mindedness, will also care for your state. So here we have a care that is a healthy, a positive care. It's not the cares of, the li of this life or the cares of this world which we saw in the sower. And it's not the same care that Martha had in, 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 in what we just read. But it's a care for the things of Christ, not for their own. Not to, because he, here he says, all seek their own. So when one is concerned about his own things only, and not the interests of others, as we read earlier, as we see earlier in Philippians 2, 
Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Then this is the right kind of care, and it's a it's a it's one that would is 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 honored by the Lord Jesus because we are caring for the things that are important or of concern to the Lord Jesus Himself. Just the expression in the King James, it's one who will naturally care for your stain. He says, I don't have someone like-minded except for Timothy. When you think naturally care, you're thinking, well, it, uh, it, is he supposed to care according to nature? Well, no, it's not according to nature at all. Because if we cared according to nature, then we are certainly not going on a spiritual line. But what he means is someone like Timothy who genuinely, through and through, transparently has no other interest but the interest of the saints. And you ask yourself, well, how much of that is really truly replicated in us? You know, what is my care for the saints? Is that there should be some benefit for me personally out of anything? Or is it because Christ is glorified in my exercises, that I am I'm pursuing the very interest of Christ? Because what you get in the next verse is, for all seek their own things, not the things of Christ. And that's the kind of world in which we live, right? A very self-centered world, self-seeking, and very often we translate that same and transfer that same uh, mentality into the Christian company. And we have to be challenged. You just talked about seeking, looking at not on my own qualities, but looking on the qualities of another. Uh, how, how very easy it is for me to be self-centered. Uh, you know, that's nature in itself and part of the flesh. But, the, but what goes counterclockwise to that is seeking the interest of others. I think that was, uh, uh, time is uh, almost out. The other two references show us the same care that Paul had for the churches. Mm -hmm. This is the Second Corinthians chapter 11, <clears throat> verse 28. Besides those things that are without that which comes upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Mm -hmm. So he was uh, caring for all the churches. This was on his heart. Mm -hmm. uh, the other reference that he had in this uh, group is caring for in, in the same body one member to another. This is in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, that we as members of one body should care for one another. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the case. That's, yeah. If I could just, on, the, on that line, the first reference was uh, Paul, the apostle, the father, his care for all the churches. The second one, in 1 Corinthians 12, talking about the body of Christ and uh, members, we are all members uh, uh, thereof, that the members should have the same care for one another. Here's the point responsibility on every member. And this is not just some select group, older, elder, that they would have the care. The, there will be passages later that will address more specifically the elders, the bishops, and their care for the flock. But in this verse, it's for every member. Uh, the, the ones that manifest want great gifts or the ones that may seem to be of a lowly or not so much of an honorable uh, status or position. All are, we are all told that they should have the same care for one another. And this is the problem that we fall into, that Christendom, Christendom has fallen into. One of the problems is the whole notion of having elevating man and he's in charge of this flock and we are to look to him to care for everyone. So someone gets sick, well send the pastor, send such and such. And so it, it, it makes everyone almost sit back and he's in charge. In this here we see that really it's a responsibility for every member of the body of Christ to have this kind of positive care for one another. Just real quick, 
uh, Brother Dave mentioned in a verse uh, in Philippians, uh, for all seek their own things, not the things of Jesus Christ. You know, I, I, I've read that verse and I think that's an odd place. You know, he, he commends uh, <coughs> Timothy saying he's got the, he's got the word like mine did and no one else. And yet he says, wait, all of us seek our own things. So there seems to be a little uh, a contradiction here. Wait, you just commended one, but you're saying the keys of everyone else? Well, that's because that's, that is the, perp the reason is uh, if we think with our own hearts, or we view things with our, in our own perspective, then yes, all of us are going to all be seeking our own things. But he answers that, that, that verse with, Timothy has the mind of Christ. He has no heart. He, he, when he thinks about things, he doesn't think, what's best for me? What's good for me? He thinks, what's good for Christ? What's good for God? And so that's the difference. It's not that he's not like you and I. It's that he's given up self, replaced it with Christ, and then he can serve. Not I, but Christ. 344. Not I, but Christ, the honored, loved, exalted. Not I, but Christ, the singing on the earth. Not Christ only Christ. 